Generative AI seems to be all that everybody talks about anymore. So retail investors in particular are probably wondering just how big the generative AI opportunity is. Well, the truth of the matter is that most of the opportunity is already here. It's already been worked on over the past decade or so. Today, we're going to talk about four functions and three industries that will benefit the most from generative AI. Now, you're probably familiar with this chart here. This is Gartner's hype cycle, and it depicts the predictable behavior of most exciting technologies. You can see generative AI there at the peak of inflated expectations. And what happens is that a technology will then fall down to the trough of disillusionment and then finally start climbing the slope of enlightenment before it uh, plateaus on its ability to uh, create productivity. And you can see here that that's not going to happen right away, but it's certainly something that you need to pay attention to in light of all the AI hype in the investment community around particular stocks. That's something we covered in this previous video titled AI Hype, and that was met with a fair amount of resistance, which is in itself a sign that AI is being hyped. You get a lot of cheerleaders and people that are just now climbing on board when this story has been writing itself for um, nearly a decade now. So uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about management consultants. My first experience with these individuals was back near the peak of the dot-com boom. I was working at Hewlett Packard as a software testing team lead, and we were building the world's fastest laser printer for Boeing. It was called Project Jalapeno. And I can recall um, I was being paid somewhere around $25 an hour, being billed at $100 an hour. And I remember learning that the, uh, I think she was from McKinsey, the consultant at the table, uh, she was billing at $550 an hour. So essentially more than 20 times what I was being paid uh, is what um, her value was. So I quickly realized that uh, management consultants uh, command a, a lot of uh, influence in large companies where they're hired to make strategic decisions. So the big three management consulting firms, BCG, Bain, and McKinsey is the biggest. And what happens is that the partners at these firms are thought leaders who direct the soldiers and their forecasts become self-fulfilling prophecy. So people like this gentleman here, uh, Michael Chui, uh, he's a partner in the Bay Area and he specializes in the impact of disruptive technologies and innovation on business. And he helped uh, put together this report we're going to look at today. It was produced in the summer of last year, but I'm sure uh, much of it is still quite relevant. It's titled The Economic Potential of Generative AI, The Next Productivity Frontier. So they talk about how AI has already emerged. People are only now noticing it. Uh, it's permeated our lives incrementally from smartphones to advanced driving solutions to ads. And the progress it's made has been almost imperceptible. And that brings up the classic statement, once it works, nobody calls it AI anymore. And they talk about clear milestones, one being AlphaGo. And this was something we touched on in our AI hype piece. And Somebody correctly pointed out that was reinforcement learning as opposed to large language models, but still it was something that was a very big deal and then quickly faded from the public's consciousness. Then came along generative AI applications such as ChatGPT, and in a way that AlphaGo didn't, they captured the world's imagination thanks to their broad number of use cases. Now, when it comes to AI adding value, there's some big numbers here. So uh, McKinsey's estimates are that generative AI could add uh, somewhere between 2.6 trillion to 4.4 trillion annually. To put that into perspective, uh, that's more than the United Kingdom's entire GDP in 2021, which is 3 trillion. So they say that this would increase the impact of all AI by 15 to 40 percent, and that estimate would essentially double if you then embedded generative AI into software that's currently being used. So that's important because a lot of people are speculating about the potential of generative AI and saying, well, it could potentially you know, kill all SaaS solutions. Well, it doesn't sound like it would because each SaaS category has a competitive space. The leaders that use generative AI will only further their competitive moat. So look for lots of aqua hires or bolt-on M&A. Now, when we define what generative AI is, 
um, they're defining it as applications typically built using foundation models and that these models contain expansive artificial neural networks. They're inspired by the human brain. And this is part of what's called deep learning. And this has powered many of the recent advances in AI, but these new foundation models are a step change evolution within deep learning. We wrote this piece back in 2016. We've been researching AI for a very long time, talking about the differences between deep learning and machine learning. And unlike previous deep learning models, these new foundation models can process extremely large and various variable sets of unstructured data and perform more than one task. Now, before we start getting into this report more, I'd invite you to visit our website. And as I said, we've been looking at AI for a very long time. I can recall in 2017, Mr. Putin saying that the country that masters AI will control the world. So we started spending a lot of time um, looking at uh, global AI. I spent two years traversing the planet from the streets of Moscow. That's where this picture was taken. That's me there. Uh, to this deserts of Saudi Arabia speaking with AI startups. We did our homework. And um, based on our research, it seems that the Chinese appear to be ahead. Now, all our research on AI is documented in a single knowledge base article. It's somewhere around 5,500 words. Anyone can access it. It's free. Here's how you access it. Go to our website, nanalyze.com, click articles and videos, then click artificial intelligence, then click investing in artificial intelligence stocks and companies. Or better yet, what you can do is in the comment section, we'll put a link to our free newsletter. You can subscribe to that. We'll provide a link to this knowledge base in the next version of that newsletter. So let's talk about something very interesting here. You see this diagram shows in blue the incremental economic impact of generative AI. Remember how they said it would be 15 to 40 percent? Well, you see that first little blue uh, bar right there? It's highlighted new generative AI use cases. That's on top of what machine learning's already doing. And that's a very important theme that we've been seeing in our recent research is that generative AI is only going to complement existing AI implementations. So while it's an exciting and rapidly advancing technology, um, other applications of AI um, stand to generate the most potential. So these have, are technologies that have been worked on for a while. So when we look at the impact of generative AI by business functions, um, there are some that stand out. These along the top here are said to represent 75% of the total annual impact of generative AI. This is what you want to pay attention to. Sales and marketing, software engineering, customer operations, and product R&D. So we're going to touch on those briefly. Now, before we do that, points to ponder here. So when you think about investing in generative AI from a retail investor's perspective, is there going to be an entirely new company that forms around some of these use cases? Or would an existing company with AI touchpoint simply add generative AI? This comes down to, for larger companies, a build versus buy decision. So the larger the company, the better their data set, the bigger competitive advantage they have. They may want to keep that data in-house. And I think SaaS firms with a large number of very large clients are in a good position here. They can acquire bolt-on functionality or aqua hires. And if they can do that in a timely enough fashion, they can capture the attention of the executives who are being told by McKinsey consultants, this is the direction that you need to move in. So that's very important. But think of publicly traded companies, of course, but don't dismiss the private ones because there's a lot of action going on there. Now, let's touch on the TAM problem here. So total addressable market as investors, this is something that we consider when looking at an investment niche. So Publicly traded companies will often exaggerate the TAM, understandably. Then you have John and Mumbai research shops. They're largely useless. It's a spray and pray approach. You'll get 20 different estimates uh, across a, a spectrum of values. Uh, even manual calculations, which we sometimes try to do, they're a best guess. So can McKinsey's MBAs with their several trillion dollar estimates come any closer to the real numbers? Well, 
They're certainly uh, more credible than some of the other sources, but you always need to take these TAMs with a grain of salt while assuming they're directionally accurate. So take, for example, customer operations. And I want to use this example of a company called Affinity. I spoke with them, this was back in 2017. I think I spoke with their head of marketing and what he said blew my mind. So first he described their functionality and how their AI algorithms were directing calls to appropriate agents based on sentiment. And what was most interesting is that he said their business model wasn't subscription-based. It was pay for performance. So the amount of money that they could save an operation, they just took a cut of it. And he said, we're raking in the cash. This is way more than we ever thought we would get from a subscription model. I thought that was very interesting. So Generative AI for customer operations is said to help less experienced agents act more like experienced agents. Well, those who were already experienced didn't see a benefit. In fact, sometimes it decreased their productivity and quality metrics. So I thought that was interesting. What you can expect to see is that all customer service support functions are going to move to human chatbots. Not the tripe you see today where it gives you a set of options like a Facebook you have to choose from. It's absolutely useless. We're talking about chatbots where they appear to be human and then an actual human will jump into the loop when needed. So think of Maria in Manila uh, where she has 35 chatbot Marias and she's managing that group and then she'll jump in for one in 50 interactions when needed and that jump in will be completely seamless. So the chatbot functionality is already in place. You just need to sprinkle it with some generative AI. And I think when you look at firms that ought to be working on this, you know, Salesforce comes to mind and this is supposed to be a $400 billion opportunity. Now, when it comes to marketing and sales, so you have uh, certainly personalization of marketing messages aimed at different, this is interesting, customer segments, geographies, and demographics. So uh, the ability to localize what we used to refer to in the testing era as localization was taking your product and making it available in 50, 60 languages. That should happen very quickly, instantly translated, and with appropriate imagery and messaging depending on your audience. And you can do that all the way down to a regional level in a particular country. And then there's SEO optimization. Well, heaven help us all there. So uh, you certainly <laughs> always want the most quality content gravitating towards the top and um, just spraying uh, the uh, search engines with a whole bunch of content is largely useless. So let's hope that search engines remain relevant and not deceived by generative AI. Uh, it says here that you can leverage user preferences, behavior, and purchase history to help customers discover the most rele relevant products. Well, Amazon's been doing that for a very long time. And this notion of upsell, cross-sell, nurturing leads, improving pipeline forecasts. That's quite interesting there. So this is roughly, what, a $900 billion opportunity. Again, companies like Salesforce, if they're on top of things, can certainly stand to offer their clients a lot of these benefits, generative AI benefits, if they have those capabilities. Then we get to software development. This is perhaps the most interesting segment. We won't talk a lot about it, but one study that McKinsey did found that software developers uh, using Microsoft's GitHub uh, completed tasks 56% faster than those that didn't use the tool, but their analysis did not account for the increase in application quality. So the first half of my career was as a software quality assurance professional. So um, you, you see a real lack in software quality these days, and to me that's a huge benefit that's not being quantified. Um, what you see... Large technology companies are already selling generative AI for software engineering, including, of course, GitHub's Copilot, uh, which is now being used by more than 20 million coders. So this is a $485 billion opportunity. That brings us to R&D. They say that this is perhaps the less recognized uh, potential generative AI application uh, compared to other business functions. So the use, this is interesting, of traditional machine learning in R&D can limit applications. So they discuss this use of what they refer to as deep learning surrogates, and it's rather interesting. So if you think about digital design optimization, so um, simulation software or digital twins, what this allows you to do is, is to examine all parameters instead of a select set and essentially cover more area in less time when running simul simulation. So they refer to this a $328 billion opportunity. Certainly companies involved in this, you know, what PTC, ANSYS, 
which I think is being acquired by Synopsys, and these firms stand to benefit in that respect. Now, when it comes to the industries that stand to have the biggest impact as a percent of total revenues, they highlighted three here, banking, high tech, and life sciences. And you can think of the use cases we talked about before, the business functions and banking support is a big component of what the banking industry has to deal with. High tech, what? Coding, of course, right? And life sciences, R&D. They spend a ton of time working on that. And and when we look at banking in particular, and this report is quite extensive, but I just wanted to pull this one example here and think about a couple of things here. So um, first, they talk about customer emergencies and credit card losses. Well, the ability to verify who's on the phone and to quickly address their problems. Anyone that's ever had a problem with their bank understands the uh, inefficiencies around that and the frustration for customers, but there, that's a very sensitive function. So uh, certainly generative AI is going to uh, come into play there. Uh, we look at marketing and sales, again, going back to content tailored for each client in banking. Uh, this is of particular interest. Uh, and then there's other functions like creating model documentation for risk and things like that. So um, you can see the potential here and what I thought was interesting is that classical banks are probably going to be in a better position to use generative AI than neobanks because they have so much data. So we're running out of time here, so I wanted to touch on some key takeaways. Uh, existing AI technologies, what we might refer to as legacy AI, stands to add the most value. Going back to that statement, once it works, nobody calls it AI anymore. Generative AI in contrast to legacy AI, stands to impact higher skilled labor. You contrast that with traditional automation technologies in the past, which always start lower. Now, chat GPT and all its friends made AI more visible, but it's always been there. AI has, has anyways. And when we look at where it, it will impact industry and functions the most, we see banking, high-tech life sciences across sales and marketing, client service, coding, and R&D. What happens with this McKinsey report is that uh, all of this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The truth of the matter is that the work has only begun, and this substantiates our thoughts on a high hype. And one last interesting takeaway I wanted to leave you with, uh, they often say the old joke, you know, freeing people up so they can work on more value-added activities when automation comes along. And here are the functions or let's say occupation groups that stand to be the most impacted by generative AI. And you can go down the list. In position number three, STEM professionals. I thought that was very interesting because we would continue to encourage today's youth to get into STEM, arguably even in the face of this metric, because in those professions, Kids learn how to learn. So a lot of you are parents. I got a question. You can answer this in the comments section. How are you going to prepare your children to thrive in a time of AI based on the evidence posed in this chart? So uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave you with another video to watch that's very interesting. Uh, it reflects on how AI hype is going to hurt your own personal investments. Give that a watch. Please make sure to like this video. Sign up for our newsletter in the comments section. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.